Okay guys, so um, you watched presentations on scene one and then you watched scene two and three and now we're going to do um, scene four and five of act one. So again, we're, we're still, we, we've moved from exposition into rising action now. Um, so as, towards the end of act one, we're really getting started on sort of getting the ball rolling on the action. Um, so act, uh, act one, scene four, uh, we're on page 1125. Um, we have Hamlet going out basically with Horatio and the rest of the guys um, to see the ghost. And um, as they're sitting there, he goes on this sort of um, discussion as they're waiting for the ghost to come around on page 1125. And he's talking about basically the nature of evil and man and whether men are born evil, or those who are, whether they're born evil or whether they become evil. And it seems to be that Hamlet believes that everyone is born um, sort of pure. And he says uh, around line, um, sorry, around line um, 25, he says that for some vicious mole of nature in them, these men, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty. So they are innocent when they are born. All men are sort of, or people are created in this pure and perfect image. Um... But since nature cannot choose his origin, his origin by their overgrowth of some complexion, so something happens to them that sort of takes root and corrupts the purity of the person. Um, so if you go to the next page, you'll see that he brings in this... Um, he, we continually have this, this imagery of sort of corruption or twistedness or something changing. And... Um, Hamlet says on, on line 35, he says, They shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance often doubt to his own scandal. So, basically he's saying that, uh, that evil is something that is put upon people. It's not something inherently with inside them. Um, so it's very interesting as we see what happens to Hamlet um, throughout the text. So I want you guys to kind of keep that in mind. Um, so Horatio says, look, here it comes, and he sees the ghost. And Hamlet has a moment where he's terrified of what he sees, and he says, Lord, angels, ministers, um, defend us. And then he starts looking at it, and he says, what shall I call in the, the visage of my father? So I shall call thee Hamlet. I think you look like Hamlet. He doesn't yet know that it really is his father. Um, and he says, answer me. So he gets kind of upset. He says, answer me. Um, what is it that casts cast thee up again? So what is it that had you come out of the ground? That thou, dead corpse, again in complete steel, so again in your, your armor, um, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition. So we ha we're going to have this discussion of nature over and over and over again. And when I just talked about sort of the nature of man, um, we also have a dual meaning. So nature there, and we have symbolism of nature kind of throughout. So we have something good. We have light and dark, which is, you know, a very classic symbol that you see. And then you saw in um, Act 1, the men who have experienced this terror, they get so excited when the sun comes over the hill because it means dawn, it means light, it means safety from the supernatural which comes in the night. Um, so here, Hamlet, if you'll notice, has he sees the night as something sort of safe and beautiful. And he says that this creature, this apparition, is making the night, it's turning the night hideous. So just after this discussion of of evil and turning something inherently good evil, we have this connection to turning the night evil. Um, so it's really interesting that Hamlet sees the night not as the problem, he sees the, the supernatural as the problem, whereas the other men saw the night as the problem. Um, so they say, look, it's, it's saying, come with me. So, and Hamlet says, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And every one of them says, no, don't, and they try to hold him back. Um, and he says, get your hands off of me. Um, and on page top of page 1127, he says, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. So, and I'll make a ghost, I'll, I'll do away with anybody who tries to stop me. 
So he's Hamlet, and they kind of step back and say, okay. And he heads off with the ghost. So they decide that they're going to follow him just in case and just keep him safe. Um, so Hamlet and the ghost kind of have an aside here, and they get to have their own interaction. And this is where we move into the rising action officially. Um, we have the ghost speak finally, right? And he says, mark me. And so Hamlet says, I will. I will pay attention to you. Um, and he says, my hour is almost up when I have to render myself the tormenting flame. So we, we get the indication that he knows that he's going to hell. Um, so if this is his father, we, we understand that his father is not an innocent soul. He has sins on him. Um, and he says, Pity not, but lend thy hearing to what I shall unfold. He says, So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. So we know that the ghost's goal is to get revenge on, it's for Hamlet to get revenge on someone else. And he says, plain out, he says, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. So we understand that he's in a type of purgatory, so it's, it's not really a clear definition of sort of what we understand. Um, heaven, hell, purgatory to be, you kind of have this combined hell and purgatory where in the day he is tortured and at night he's condemned to walk the earth until um, his sins are purged. And part of that is going to be Hamlet doing, taking revenge for him. Um, so where he says, revenge me for my foul and un most unnatural murder. And Hamlet says, murder? What are you talking about? Um, he says, murder most foul. is a very famous line. Um, but the most foul, strange, and unnatural. So I want you to keep those three words in mind. Most foul, strange, and unnatural. We're going to have this image, again, like I said, over and over again, of something pure being turned into something grotesque and foul and putrid and evil. Um, so keep that image in mind as you watch Hamlet over the course of the play. So he says, I want you to take revenge on somebody. And then the ghost has this... this this soliloquy, not soliloquy, this little section on, on page 1128, um, he has a section on um, how, well, Hamlet says, why me? And he says, why well, find thee steadfast, thou, um, sorry, and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed. Um, so this is Hamlet, listen to me. Sleeping in the orchard, a serpent stung me. So this is a metaphor, obviously, and it's a biblical illusion. We know what the, the serpent stands for. It stands for the devil. Um, and he says, the devil himself um, tricked me and stung me and took my life. And he has this very long piece where he talks about um, what he thought was heaven, what he thought was beauty, what he thought was purity, was really underneath evil. And he's talking about his wife. Um, and he says, and thus, with, um, around line 75, he says, and thus was I sleeping by my brother's hand of life, crown and queen at once displayed. So we find out that his brother is the one who murdered him, um, and his mother knew about it. Um, so we have Hamlet's uh, got an existential crisis, for sure. Um, so Hamlet, he says, remember me, revenge me, and he exits. And Hamlet says um, that remember thee, of course I'm going to remember thee. He says, poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, I will always remember you. Um, so he says, I'll take away the table of my memory and wipe away all trivial fond records. So everything that fills up the library of my life, it's a metaphor, um, is going to be of you. Um, all the books and volumes of my brain, all the unmixed uh, with base matter, so nothing else in my mind will exist but avenging you. Um, so Horatio and Marcellus come in and they say, my lord, my lord, are you alright? And basically he tells them, don't tell anybody what you saw here tonight. And they swear that they won't. And then you see sort of the ghostly apparition behind them and everything Hamlet says, the ghost repeats. So on page 1130 he's saying, swear. And the ghost says, swear. And they swear. And then, it's, and then he pulls out his uh, sword and he says, swear on the sword. And the ghost says, swear on the sword. And they swear. So it's this very weird, creepy echo um, that can happen from father to son. Or son to father, sorry, opposite way. Um, so then Hamlet basically at this point decides that he's going to have to go back and he's going to have to do something. 
Um, and you, you have to keep in mind the, the crisis that he's facing. If he goes back and rails against his, his, his uncle and his mother and says, you murdered my father, no one's going to believe him. Um, he also can't be an upstart against the king. Um, he may be the prince, but the king has all the power. The king has the power to banish him from the kingdom, and he can't very well do anything if he's not there. So, keep that in mind as you start reading um, uh, Act 2. Sorry. Um, and then when you guys work through Act 2, um, I'll have another explanation at the end of Act 2. And then um, that's it for the week. And then you can move into Act 3 if you like for the next week.